tales for dark nights. Nothing I've learned prepared me for this. We've grown up in an age of reason, where we can reduce everything into numbers. That which we cannot explain we turn into myth, Whispers over campfires, blown up into cheap thrills on the big screen. We've glossed over our fears and the true nature of the world with explanation and tinsel. We never understand what's happening until it's too late. I can't explain what happened to us over the past month. I can't accept it. I can't live with the feeling I have as I sit here laying this all out. I can feel their eyes on the back of my neck as I sit at the desk and try to make sense of it all. Or perhaps I already know, and my mind skitters away from the truth I feel deep in my bones and my gut. One day I will fail, and I will join Sarah soon. But there is some time before that, time enough to tell my story, whether you believe it or not. It was a month and a lifetime ago, the first time Sarah and I had gotten away for a real break since our honeymoon. Our lives had filled up with the little hollow milestones of the corporate race, chasing a promotion here, a client there, living from deadline to deadline. No time for children yet, although we were thinking about it. There was more silence between us than words. It felt good to be on the road, leaving our jobs behind for the first time in years. We followed the coast up to New England, Stephen King, and Lovecraft country, never knowing where we'd rest our heads or which fork in the road to take. It was on that trip that we wound up at a small, obscure bed and breakfast. I won't say where it is. I would happily go back there and burn it to the ground. Back then, it was magic. We felt alive again. The whitewashed facade broke the horizon with the pride of a tombstone. The owner was a dour and cadaverous man by the name of Bryce. Deep bags under his eyes betrayed his lack of sleep. He possessed an obvious fascination for history and the macabre. The walls were lined with rows of photographs, most yellowed with age. As we wandered deeper down the corridor to our room, they lost the gloss and color of modern photography, reverting to the severe monochrome of yesteryear. Our room was decorated in a lavish Victorian style, a strange departure from the simple modern outlook of the rest of the house. The centerpiece of the room was a lush, magnificent painting on the wall, depicting a serene field and a young girl in a simple yellow frock sitting down to a picnic meal on the green. In the background, a dark, forbidding forest provided contrast to the azure sky and the verdant meadow. Sarah squealed with delight at the find. She'd studied art appreciation at the college where we met. Like water from a dishcloth, our jobs had squeezed many small joys from our lives but I think she missed the art the most. Look at the work on this, Sarah gushed, reverently bringing her fingertips almost but not quite to the painting. It's so fine. You can barely see the brush strokes. And the girl, she looks so sad. I stood beside her, examining the painting. I found it strange that something so exquisite and masterful found a home in such a strange little house so far removed from the beaten trail. Adorning the painting's frame was a brass plaque, its inscription rendered indecipherable by corrosion. I settled down for the evening to catch up on some reading. Sarah couldn't quite get enough of the painting. She spent what seemed like hours staring at it, occasionally pulling me over to examine some minute detail or trick of the brushwork. We stayed there just a single night, but it was one of the most restful we'd ever had. During checkout in the morning, the owner swiped my card. Sarah interjected, How much for the painting in in the room? 
Bryce looked up, and where I expected him to appear bemused or to take offense to the question, he instead gave a look of heartfelt gratitude, his pale features lighting up with a crooked smile the first I'd seen since we'd been at the inn. You couldn't stop talking about it at breakfast, could you? Sarah nodded in response. It's not good to me here anymore. It reminds me too much of my wife. There's still a little bit of her in that painting, I feel. If the painting really likes you that much, it would be better in your home than mine. I was puzzled at his choice of words. He was a strange man. Perhaps the words had come out garbled. If the painting really likes you, he had said, I was sure of it. He put another fifty dollars on my card and helped load the painting into the car. As we drove off, I cast a glance at my rearview mirror. Catching a glimpse of Bryce in the reflection, I could have sworn he looked a decade younger. The painting found its new home in our living room. The first order of business was to polish the plaque at the base of the frame. The sharp tang of the solvent stung my nose as I scrubbed away at the green crust. Flake by flake it yielded till the little metal rectangle gleamed. A family picnic in the meadow, the inscription read, 1893. A family picnic, but with just a single girl. I stared at the small white figure again. The girl at the picnic wore a wide grin on her face. I was oddly discomforted by that queer smile. Skeptical, I took out my phone to examine the photographs I had taken of the painting earlier and zoomed in on the tiny figure in the images. I held my phone up to the painting to be sure and confirmed my suspicions. The girl hadn't been smiling at the end. I called Sarah into the room to get her opinion, and she brushed off the changes as a trick of the light. When photographing paintings, she argued, the angle and lighting could make all the difference. We laughed it off, but I still gave the painting a furtive look as we left the room. I was hovering in that dark, restless space between exhaustion and slumber when I first felt the warm glow of the summer sun on my skin. The sensation was strange when compared to the crisp springtime chill of our bedroom. Soft grass brushed the skin of my forearms and palms. The light scent of wildflowers tickled my nose. I came to with a start, shaking my head to clear the fog of sleep, and found myself back in my room. The sensation of the open field faded, and I felt an emptiness on the other side of the bed well before I saw the impression of my wife's sleeping form, still warm with lingering body heat and smelling of summer. Rising from bed, I hissed as my toes encountered the frigid parquet floor. Sarah, I called into the darkness beyond the bedroom door. Something was there at the edge of my hearing, something that I couldn't make out. I padded through the silent corridor to the living room and found Sarah sitting there, striking a lurid pose in her nightgown. Her eyes were rolled back in her head, the whites glistening in her gloom. Her mouth hung open in a parody of a smile. A string of drool dangled from her chin. Her long brown hair, animated by an inexplicable breeze, blew across her face. And with that, the spell was broken. The windows were shut. The air was still. There was no breeze in the living room. I looked up at the painting and found the girl in the painting, leering down at me, seated in a position identical to Sarah's. Just then, a whisper of cloth caught my attention. Turning, I saw Sarah, with all the broken grace of a marionette, rise to her feet and make her way back up the corridor. I felt a crunch under my bare foot. There, its pale juices staining the wooden floor, was a crushed wildflower. Sarah woke up refreshed the next morning. I fared less well. Sleep's embrace when it finally came was uncomfortable. 
The darkness behind my eyelids hid nameless horrors and a smiling girl on a picnic blanket. I approached Sarah as she puttered at the sink and asked if she had slept well. She smiled and told me it was the best sleep she'd had in months, then casually added that she half remembered a dream of talking to someone in a warm place. In an instant, my expression became grim. With Sarah's simple affirmation, all of the strangeness of the night before, which had melted away in the morning sun, came rushing back. Once Sarah had left for the day, I poured myself a stiff drink and took it to the living room. It had once been my favorite room in the house. There was no peace for me there any more. From the second I stepped into the room, the hair on the back of my neck prickled. It was the painting. I felt as if it was watching me, that she was watching me. The strange brass plaque and the shifting face of the girl in the painting had already unsettled me, but seeing my wife sprawled on the floor with that ghastly smile on her face, that was too much. I resolved to take the painting down and keep it in the garage for a bit. If Sarah asked, I would tell her that I had to take it down to make further repairs. As I tried to lift the heavy frame off the nail on the wall, however, it wouldn't budge. I groped around the edge of the frame, trying to find the spot where the supporting wire hung off the nail in the wall. I tiptoed, attempting to wedge my fingers further in between the wall and the frame. My calves burned with the strain, but I found it just before the muscles gave out. Strangely, there didn't seem to be anything wrong with the wire. I gave a gentle tug and stumbled backwards, gasping as the sharp edge of a nail caught the tip of my index finger and tore a flop of skin off. Meanwhile, the heavy frame fell to the floor with a gunshot-like bang, the sound echoing through the house. Bright crimson welled up and ran down to my knuckles as I got to my feet. Specks of blood dotted the floor, forming a trail leading straight to the painting. Where a large drop had struck the surface of the image, a scarlet smear marred the features of its subject. Beneath the red sheen, the girl's wide smile took a whole new dimension of eeriness. Hiding the painting was one thing, but ruining it was another thing altogether. I scurried to the kitchen and moistened the kitchen towel. The pain had settled into a dull ache. I rushed back to the living room. I knelt over the fallen painting and stared back into the pristine, pale face of the girl. There was blood on the floor. There was blood on my hand. But there was no blood on the painting, only the ever-widening, mocking smile on her face. I fled the room, haunted by the smell of flowers and the whisper of the summer breeze. I moved the painting to the floor of the study and told Sarah that I would fix up something better for it to hang from. The decision didn't sit well with her. We had our first fight in months over it. I won out in the end only after pointing out that the heavy frame had started to bend the nail in the wall. After that, for a while at least, the painting gave us no more trouble. The respite was short-lived. It wasn't long before the disturbances started up again, slowly at first, always at night, and always unexpected. Lying in my bed, with my toes poking out from under the blanket, I'd dream of the warmth of the summer sun or feel the hot breeze on my skin. I got a prescription for sleeping pills from the doctor. The chemical fog did little to chase away those alien sensations at night. The sense of violation, of invasion was absolute. There was no rest for me in my own home. It grew worse. Once I found a trail of dirt and blades of grass ending at the foot of our bed. Sarah was curled up in bed. Her deep breaths told me that she was sound asleep. I followed the trail of glass, blade by crushed blade, to the hallway and left the comfort of my room, knowing full well where it led. The air in the study was hot, the smell of the field magnified into a greenhouse reek. Beads of sweat formed on my brow. As always, the smiling girl was there, staring at me. There was something mocking, something mesmerizing about her eyes. 
The artist had painted them with a dark humor, so realistically that it looked like looking at a photograph. The flickering moonlight cast her pale face into shadow one moment and silvery illumination the next. The shifting light softened the lines of the painting. The long grass stirred as if by a breeze. I imagined the clouds drifting across the clear blue sky. I leaned closer, taken in by the new illusion. My forearm brushed against the weave of the canvas. And then, pain. I looked at my forearm. A line of blood had formed where I had been scratched. Reeling in horror, I backed away from the painting. The girl was no longer in her relaxed pose. She had stepped a little closer and had extended a sharp fingernail in my direction. Her face, much nearer to the foreground now, bore the same wide, familiar grin. Sarah refused to believe me the next morning. She laughed it off, saying that she had sleepwalking episodes as a child and suggested that I may have wandered out of the house and into the yard. On the subject of haunted paintings and the like, she would hear nothing more. Occam's razor sliced away at my doubts. The simpler explanation was the better of the two, the one that did not peel back the comforting skin the world wore. Everything could be rationalized. The nocturnal wanderings, my obsession with the painting spilling over into dreams, the light playing tricks on my eyes. Or maybe the girl in the painting was just toying with us. Over the course of the next two weeks, Sarah's nightly escapades became more frequent. Surprisingly, I grew accustomed to her nightly wanderings, the strange smells, and the alien sensations. But my last experience was different. That night I woke with a start and noticed Sarah was gone. The sound of a low wordless melody coming from the living room had woken me. Someone was singing. I got out of bed. As I stood up, a hot breeze seared my face. I realized then that something was twisting my senses. I was in my room. It was the middle of spring and the air was still. I stole down the corridor, feeling the worn parquet floor one second and blades of grass tickling my feet the next. Meanwhile, the singing grew louder. Curious, I stepped into my study and flicked the light switch on. For a moment, I blinked away the harsh glare of the afternoon sun, and then it was gone, replaced by the soft glow of the ceiling lamp. The painting was still there, but there was something different about it. I could only stand there and gape as my mind struggled to process what my eyes were telling it. The girl wasn't in the painting. Sarah. I had to find her. The living room. The singing. The distance felt like miles. Arriving at the end of the corridor, I again found Sarah seated on the floor with her back turned and wearing a light sundress. The perfect type for a day out in the park. The moonlight through the windows gave the room an unearthly glow. It was then that I realized Sarah was not alone. She was hunched over something. A pair of painfully thin legs poked out from under her right arm. A gaunt arm was hooked around her shoulder. The sharp nail scourged her bare back. Fine, bloody lines stood out on her pale skin. I shuddered and glanced at the scratch on my forearm. I strode over to the light switch and flipped it. For a second, just for a second, I lost sight of both Sarah and that thing. Then, a moment later, it was gone, leaving me alone with my wife. I called out to Sarah but got no response. She continued singing in the same wordless lullaby, all the while rocking back and forth, the bumps of her vertebrae clear against her pale skin. I stepped forward slowly and called out again. Her expression was empty. Her mouth was slack and open, her lips working to force out the nameless tune. The worst, however, was not on her face, but her dress. A strap hung halfway down her shoulder, exposing a single bloodied breast, defaced by distinct crescent-shaped bites. I left Sarah in the living room, 
intending to put an end to the painting. There was something unholy about it, and I was not going to stop until it had been reduced to ashes. When I next laid eyes on the image, the girl was back where she belonged, sitting in the green meadow. Her lips were ringed with red that ran down her chin. All I needed was some lighter fluid out of the garage and a box of matches. I lifted the heavy frame off the floor and was just about to back out of the room when Sarah barreled into me. She clawed and shrieked like a thing possessed, her nails scrabbling at my chest. She was a waifish hundred pounds, but her frenzied assault brought me to my knees. She managed to wrestle the painting away from me. The sharp edge of the frame caught me flush on my chin. My entire world went white. I sat up. The merciless sun beat down from overhead. Unseen cicadas lent their voices to a shrill chorus. The smell of flowers was overpowering. A mouth-watering feast, a picnic complete with fruit and sandwiches, lay before me, spread out on fine china. And then there was Sarah, seated beside the girl from the painting. There was still something wrong with the tableau, like the view through the holographic viewfinders from my youth. There were two pictures in front of me. The first, the scene from the painting, with the young girl and the picnic spread. The second, something out of a nightmare. In it, the girl was nothing but a character of a human being. Dry skin stretched taut over bones. It smiled at me. Sarah just sat there, catatonic. The girl leaned forward and picked up a strawberry from the basket of fruit. Its pale fingers stuffed the plump fruit into Sarah's mouth. I caught a strange glimpse from the corner of my eye and looked again. The strawberry was rancid, its darkened patches beginning to liquefy. I gagged. When the girl opened her mouth, Sarah's voice came out. You're finally here, it said. I'm dreaming all this. Sarah's been dreaming you all this time. Or could it be me dreaming you, it asked back. "'smiling with perfect white teeth. "'No.' "'I looked again. "'The teeth were jagged and yellow, "'poking out from blackened gums. "'She stuffed another strawberry into Sarah's mouth. "'I couldn't move my body. "'I was stuck watching this slow torture, "'this thing slowly choking my wife. "'Sarah's eyes bulged as she struggled to breathe. "'It turned to face me. "'It's a family portrait.' It always needs a family. My family never stays long. Won't you stay, too? This one's already mine. We can be so happy together. Such things I can show you. The sanguine juice from the strawberries dripped down Sarah's chin. She began to gag, her throat obstructed. I strained, but my muscles would not obey me. I was utterly helpless. Sarah locked eyes with me. Help me, they pleaded. Please help. The girl paused in her ministrations for a moment, leaning across the picnic basket towards me. She stroked the side of my paralyzed face with soft fingers and gave me a sly smile. Somewhere else, that emaciated monstrosity leered at me, raking my cheek with needle-sharp nails. Sarah's voice issued from its cracked lips once more. You're going to go now. I, I can't keep you. But you'll be back. Don't fight it. We'll be one happy family. She got closer and kissed me fully on the lips. Just as she pulled back, she caught the edge of my lip with those rotten teeth. There was a sting as she bit down hard, and when she sat back next to my wife, a smear of my blood encircled her lips. She waved as my world went white. When I came to, Sarah was beside me on the floor. Her eyes had once again rolled back into her head, and she was shaking like a leaf in the wind. A thin line of blood trickled down her chin, resembling the juice from earlier. I took one last look at the smiling girl and the painting before I left. It wasn't the same painting we had brought home. I saw it as it really was. The grass browned and wilted as far as the eye could see. Bones strewn in the field, bleached white by the harsh sun. The sky blood-red, and the girl, a horror of skin and bones, 
grinning wildly, my blood still visible on her lips. I scooped Sarah up and left the house. The doctor said she had suffered an aneurysm. Somewhere along the highways and byways within Sarah's brain, there was a little loop of traffic, a small loop where things didn't flow as planned, and one day, nobody knows why it was that day and not some other, there was an accident. Sarah's strange behavior after the fact was so easy to explain. She had a seizure when the blood vessel burst. I got up, and in my mad haste to rush her to the hospital, I had run into something. I had blocked out and hallucinated the encounter. It was so deceptively easy to believe because it fit in the system of the world, the ordered lie we pretend to believe. But it all came crashing down soon enough. After spending a week living out of an overnight bag at the hospital, I was finally evicted by Sarah's parents and forced to go home to get some proper rest. The first thing that caught my eye was the painting. I felt the reality of the past few weeks come crashing down on me. The feeling of it drove me to my knees. I pulled myself to my feet, suddenly unable to breathe. I wasn't sure if I'd ever see Sarah as she once was. Regardless, I wasn't going to allow the painting's presence in my home for another minute. I was hosting it off the floor when something caught my eye. There, in the meadow, basking in the bright summer sun, was Sarah. Sarah, my beautiful wife, captured in paint on a canvas more than one hundred years old. Her appearance was unmistakable. I had woken up beside her for the better part of a decade, and even through the haze of tears I recognized her features. And as before, the girl in yellow sat beside her, smiling at me, an arm draped around my wife's slim shoulders. I fear sleep now, worrying that one day I will wake up back in that meadow with Sarah and the girl. I tremble at the thought of returning there, helpless to defend Sarah. But most of all, I dread that whatever was left in the painting wasn't going to be my wife anymore. That even if I found a way to get her back, if that shell in the hospital bed with the tubes and wires and pumps opened its eyes again, it wouldn't be Sarah. I'll never know who Bryce had lost to the painting or how long he had watched and waited and dreamt in that New England inn. I remember the look on his face when we drove off. Freedom. I have to stop. The painting is still there and the weight of their stairs is too much to bear. Before going to bed, I touch a shaky fingertip to the painted doppelganger of my wife. I raise it back to my own lips to kiss her goodnight, and notice a slight aftertaste. Not the dust coating the painting, or the chemical tang of paint. Something different. Something slightly salty. The taste of tears. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.